Um, welcome to the Cyborg series. This is our first event, our first guest session, not technically our first event. Our first event was last week. We started our reading group. So if anybody is interested in joining that going forward, they're very welcome to do so. So uh, the Cyborg series is a guest speaker session and reading series intended to create a forum for graduate students to consider the difficulties of interdisciplinary research and hopefully think of ways to overcome them. So the thinking behind this is that you hear a lot of people thinking that interdisciplinary is the best thing ever and it's the future. And you hear a lot of people saying it's the worst thing ever and it's terrible, but there's never, there's often, not often a very balanced in between. So we're here trying to create a forum to think about, well, there's difficulties, but how do we overcome them in a sort of an effective and ethical way? Um, the series is led by myself and also Arno Zimmerman and Kristen Carlson, who are here as well. Um, the three of us are from the English department. Arno is currently a postdoc. Kristen and I are in our dissertation phase in the English department. And we're all motivated by our own attempts at interdisciplinary research um, and our experiences and the difficulties that, that, that we've encountered in terms of communication, in terms of mastering other disciplines, in terms of reaching out to people in other disciplines and so on and so forth. All these problems, we talked amongst ourselves about them and um, we thought it would be a good idea to create this forum to bring more people into the conversation about how to go about this kind of research. So um, we have Professor Hales here and we're gonna have a conversation between Professor Marshall and Professor okay. Hales. The reason we wanted to do the conversation um, structure rather than a presenting a paper structure was that we really want the series to focus on peeling back the curtain on inter interdisciplinary research, the process, the sort of day-to-day -day work that you have to do to get to the point where you can, where you can um, present a paper at a conference or produce a dissertation in this kind of research. Um, the barriers we want to talk about are institutional challenges and disinten disincentives to interdisciplinary work and how we can overcome those. Challenges of communication in terms of accessing and understanding and applying work from other disciplines to your own research appropriately. Practical challenges like how to reach out to other people in, in people in other disciplines, how to train ourselves in an ethical and an effective way to apply work in other disciplines to our own research and uh, how to foster meaningful interdisciplinary dialogue. So how do we go about uh, creating interdisciplinary links and research groups and relationships that sort of have, that, that, that obtain over time and aren't just a sort of flash in the pan and you forget about it after you have done it. Um, before we get started, I'm gonna thank our sponsors. Uh, we have a uh, sponsorship from Grad Life Grants here in Notre Dame, the Notre Dame Graduate Students Union, and also the Navarre Center for Digital Scholarship, which is our digital humanities hub in the Notre Dame, Notre Dame Library. So practical things, uh, for this session, Professor Hales and Professor Marshall would talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll go to Q&A. If you have questions while we, uh, Professor uh, Marshall and Professor Hales are talking, you can enter a question in the chat box and we'll, uh, one of our moderators will read it out when we get to the Q&A, um, or else you can wait until the end of the talk and then you can raise a little virtual hand and you can ask your question directly to Professor Hales or Professor Marshall indeed, if you wish. So. Uh, just to introduce our guests, um, Professor Hales graduated with an undergraduate degree in chemistry from Rochester Institute of Technology and a master's in chemistry from Caltech before switching disciplines and ultimately getting a PhD in English literature from the University of Rochester. Uh, she has been an English professor at the University of Iowa, UCLA, and currently Duke, where she was also the director of graduate studies in the liter literature program. Uh, she has published widely, widely on all kinds of topics um, in the intersection of literature and science, including chaos theory, post-humanism, cognitive studies, electronic media, and the digital humanities. Uh, just a few of her books, and there's many, and they're all excellent, um, include Chaos Unbound, Orderly Disorder in Contemporary Literature and Science, How We Became Post-Human, Virtual Bodies in Cybernetics, Literature, and Informatics, and most recently, On Thought, The Power of the Cognitive Nonconscious. And Professor Marshall, as you'll probably know, Professor Marshall is Professor of English here um, at the University of Notre Dame. She's also our Director of Graduate Studies, and she's also works with the History and Philosophy of Science program. Her work focuses on 20th century American literature and engages with media theory, narrative, the philosophy of science, and related modes of critical attention that illuminate how novels work as aesthetic and communicative systems and cultural agents. So I will pass it over to Professor Marshall, and remember if you have a question as we're going along, you can pop it in the chat or you can wait until the Q&A. Okay, well, thanks so much, Claudia. Um, and uh, before we get started, I just wanted to um, take a second to um, express my admiration and appreciation for the organizers of this series, Claudia Carroll, Kristen Carlson, and Arnon Zimmer. Um, 
they've done a really tremendous job setting up the series, organizing it, and also um, developing the questions that are gonna guide the conversation that we have today. Um, and so I'm very excited to be a participant in this and to have a chance to continue a conversation about interdisciplinarity that for me began 19 years ago when I met Professor Hales um, at the earliest moments of my own graduate career. Um, so I'm looking forward to um, what we're going to be doing. So the first question that we were going to start with today um, has to do with your background um, and thinking about um, how um, it has guided your, uh, your scholarship um, from its earliest moments. And so what we were going to be thinking about with you was how your background in chemistry um, thinking through to, um, as Claudia just mentioned, your master's in chemistry from Caltech, how does that um, influence your, how did that influence your approach to the humanities? And so why did you decide to move into the humanities? What challenges did you face in the shift between the humanities and science? And what did that shift afford you intellectually, methodologically, or professionally? Well, uh, thank you, Kate, for that question. And I'd also like to add my thanks to you as the interlocutor and to the series organizers for setting this up and inviting me to be here. This is a, an exciting event for me and I'm really delighted to share thoughts with you. So going back to my, um, my earliest uh, years as a professional, uh, I think my background in science, which came before my literary training, gave me a, a real appreciation for the rigor of the sciences, the um, exciting frontiers that scientific fields are continually opening, and a real respect for empirical research and what it could show us. Um, when I uh, went from undergraduate work in chemistry to Caltech, which is mostly a research institution, I uh, discovered what most people in science discover sooner or later, which is that actual scientific research often consists of rather mundane work in the laboratory uh, and not so much the excitement of ideas that made me love science as an undergraduate. So I, I began increasingly to feel that I wanted to ask larger questions than one can normally do in scientific research. And when I had started college, I had two passions, one for science and the other for literature. So I began seriously thinking about uh, shifting to literature. And I uh, then took a master's degree and, uh, at Caltech and then began working in literary studies. And it was a huge, huge culture shock for me. And it really um, defined my life trajectory since then. And I discovered as uh, Tom Stoppard has one of his characters say, everything I thought I knew was wrong including what counts for evidence, how do you make an argument uh, to the very fundamentals of uh, what research is. So I, I spent uh, several months resisting those new approaches for my new adopted field of literary studies. And then I realized I could never succeed in that field, uh, whole clinging on to my old ideas. So I sort of stuffed them in a closet and shut the door and set about learning the essentials of my new field, which meant giving up those old ideas. But after I had uh, been thoroughly immersed in the new field and mastered at least some of its protocols, I then, uh, after I received my PhD, decided I would open the door and see what I could make of the uh, collision and also sometimes the startling conversion, convergence of these two very different fields that weren't talking to each other. So, um, so that's sort of uh, what I, uh, a capsule version of that part of my history. What I learned from the sciences was um, not only the approaches, uh, that defines scientific research, but a kind of toolkit of 
uh, essential knowledge uh, in mathematics, for example, calculus, algebra, linear calculus, and so forth. Um, and I learned um, a uh, deep skepticism of large claims built on very flimsy evidence. And I discovered very quickly that in my new field of literary studies, such claims were pervasive. So uh, I entered this new field with a kind of skeptical eye toward this tendency to build grand theories on uh, almost nothing. And uh, so I, I think I have in my own work tried to find a solid empirical basis for most of what I claim. And uh, I also in the sciences developed a, an appreciation for the ability to state clearly what your claim is and why you think it's convincing. And in the humanities, very often uh, fogginess or unclarity is seen as a virtue and it's often taken as a sign that one is profound if it's very difficult to understand what one is saying. And I've even received occasionally the advice from my colleagues that I should try to be less clear. Uh, but I, I've never taken that advice. I always aspire to clarity and I subscribe to the idea I absorb from the sciences that if you can't explain your idea clearly so that other people can understand it, perhaps you don't understand it yourself. So that's part of the ethos of science, which I've carried over into literary studies, as well as um, a basic vocabulary that allows me to read mid-level complex scientific articles and understand them which has been extremely important in my research. Thank you. So if we could move um, even deeper into um, some of your interdisciplinary work, um, we were hoping you could talk a little bit more um, about your relationship with interdisciplinarity, for especially for those here who aren't as familiar with some of your body of work. And so for example, in recent work on cognition um, in Unthought, the Power of Cognitive Non-Cognition, non um, this is from 2017, how do you see the connection working between neuroscience and the humanities? So um, have you encountered resistance to your interdisciplinary research, either from the humanities side or from the scientific side? Well, I, I've certainly encountered resistance from both sides um, on many occasions. It's very difficult to be able to um, give a rendition of the scientific information in a way that won't alienate the scientists. And inevitably, when one goes into a field of which one is not uh, a master, uh, the devil is in the details. You're, likely to get the big ideas correct, but uh, they're all the nuances that experts will recognize. And my advice about that is that uh, it's very good to cultivate relationships with people in the field that you're trying to learn something about. Uh, be, a, be a good citizen, contribute what you can to them, and in exchange, ask them to read your work and to identify for you places where those nuances might be incorrect or misleading. So this uh, immediately suggests a kind of collaborative model where you contribute what you can contribute, but you also ask for something from your collaborators to help you get those nuances uh, as perfect as you can get them. So as for the book Unthought, The Power of the Cognitive Nonconscious, uh, I became aware of some of this research uh, because I do read uh, things like um, New Scientist and other uh, scientific magazines regularly, uh, that uh, this new field of neuroscience was making some discoveries about non-conscious cognition that seemed to me very relevant to literary studies. Uh, and moreover, it seemed to me to provide an opening to rethink the whole issue of cognition in general. Uh, 
And like many others in the humanities, I've become increasingly concerned and alarmed about uh, the possibility of the collapse of the biosphere uh, for all the reasons that we know only too well. Um, and I felt that part of the problem here was a um, misunderstanding of uh, the whole issue of cognition and the possibility of making meaning. And I felt it was very important to begin to open up the question of whether meaning making practices are confined only to humans or whether they are more pervasive. And in my search for, um, for approaches to that question, I happened upon biosemiotics, which I had gotten interested in several years ago, but now return with, uh, with a much more intense interest. And I realized that bio, biosemioticians have been making the argument for years that non-human organisms do engage in meaning-making practices. And that led me to try to forge a definition of cognition that would open it far beyond the human to all life forms, including those without brains like nematode worms, including those beyond mammals or animals in general to plants. Um, and that for me was a, was a real act of discovery. So my definition of cognition was that it is a process of interpreting information in context that connect it with meaning. And this means that uh, it is species specific because those contexts include the biological apparatus of the perceiving organism. And it means that the act of interpretation goes way beyond verbal or conscious interpretations into responses to environment, environmental stimuli. So with that definition of cognition, I launched the argument that all life forms have cognitive capabilities and consequently all life forms engage in meaning making practices specific to their species and specific to the context in which they live and interpret information. And this way of looking at non-human cognition, I think, uh, well, as I argued, uh, opened uh, an approach that would get us beyond anthropocentrism into a much deeper and richer understanding of the human place in the entire uh, living biosphere. And in addition, the way I define cognition also opened it to understand computational media as also capable of cognitive acts and meaning making practices. And this understanding of computational media, I think, is increasingly important as we come to rely on computers to interpret and understand our world. If we don't see them as capable of cognition, of mere mechanical calculation, we miss much of the huge impact they're having on human practices and human society. So I thought it was important to create a framework that would let us talk about non-humans, humans, and computational media all within the same uh, gestalt, if you will. Great, thank you. Um, if we can hone in a little bit on a methodology question, um, in the introduction to um, another of your books, How We Think, you applaud the sciences for a more problem-based um, approach. And you also write that there must be a place for problem-based inquiry in the humanities and sciences. And so could you explain um, a little bit um, of what this type of inquiry might look like, um, especially for early scholars who are interested in building it into their interdisciplinary research or more broadly, Broadly, what methodologies from science would you think would be our most productive for the humanities and vice versa? Um, and another follow-up question kind of built into this would be, what are the broad fundamental differences you see between the humanities and sciences in terms of some of these goals and approaches um, and assumptions? Well, the, the sciences in general are motivated by finding solutions to very specific and highly articulated problems. Um, they, they want to accomplish something, they need to do research to find out how best to accomplish that, and uh, nowhere is this illustrated more 
clearly in my mind than in uh, the, all the recent advances in gene editing, uh, which are built on fundamental scientific discoveries, but then developed in very specific ways to enable um, gene corrections and insertions to work. So in the humanities, it's relatively, uh, relatively unusual to take a problem-based approach. I remember early in my career, I was having a conversation with a colleague and talking about some issue I was working on. And he said, well, the difficulty with you is that you see these as problems you, you're finding solutions for. And I said, yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly what I'm doing. What are you doing? And he said, well, I am investigating problematics. So to me, that sort of encapsulates the difference uh, in the humanities. There's a feeling that everything is infinitely interpretable and um, discourse will go on forever. And the goal is not really to achieve closure, but to continue the conversation. Now there's, there's some merit in that approach, uh, but the problem with that approach in my point, from my point of view is that uh, it can result in some extended navel gazing where the humanities seem increasingly irrelevant to the real problems that are facing the world. And uh, now, of course, we're immersed in all kinds of problems, environmental problems, problems with the pandemic, of political problems, on and on and on. So there's more reason than ever, I think, to consider a, a problem-based approach. Now, on the other side, the difficulty with a problem-based approach is that it cuts off consideration of those important issues that really will never have any solutions. Like, for example, what is the meaning of life? Well, there, nobody is ever going to give a definitive answer to that question. You can have a lot of provisional answers that are circumscribed and contextual. Uh, and there's really even no way to adjudicate between, between all these different answers. So there, are, there is merit to, uh, to considering the problematic approach as well. What I think works well is a kind of combination of the two where you don't uh, spin around forever in investigating problematics, you do actually try to tackle some of the world's important problems from a humanistic point of view, uh, but you still remain open to the possibility that there are important issues which need continuing conversation. Thanks so much. Um, so for the next couple questions are gonna be a little bit more on the practical side. Um, so to start with, um, Wanted to ask about um, how you present work to audience, different kinds of audiences, different audiences in different disciplinary and institutional contexts. So how do you go about preparing to present to different fields? Um, do you think very differently about humanities and science audiences? Is all of your work really intended, intended for both? So one example is, you know, if we've been talking a little bit about unthought being primarily about ideas related to um, cognition, but in that book, you also use literary close readings to illustrate um, to illustrate your theory and also end with an argument about the need for attention to the cognitive non-conscious in the humanities. And so, um, you know, is that work, for example, intended to appeal to cognitive scientists as well as to literary critics? And how it also does it fit into that broader question about, about audiences when you're doing this work? Well, I think one of the things that uh, humanists can offer to scientists are ways to expand the implications of their research in ways that they may not have thought of. Uh, to give you an example, uh, last week I was engaged in a conversation with a semiotician, a biologist from Estonia, a very distinguished man in his field, and uh, I was making the argument that some of the conclusions and methods of biosemiotics can be extended to computational media. 
And I dare say that he had never considered this. He had only considered the realm of biological organisms. But being presented with the argument of showing how these ideas could be extended, he found them uh, amenable and, in fact, exciting about the ways that he could uh, broaden the purview of his research. And even if he himself never went in that direction, simply to know that such a venture was possible was, I think, a, a contribution to his worldview, if you will. So I think that humanists can often um, point out implications that scientists themselves may not have thought of or may have thought of, but put them aside because they are too focused on accomplishing their immediate uh, solution to the problem that they've addressed. I'll give one more example. When I was at Iowa, I was uh, friends with a, with a biologist who was working on solving the problem of aging. And I said, well, if your research is successful, uh, what would that mean? And he said, well, if, if uh, we accomplish what I hope we can accomplish, we would extend the human lifespan, a normal human lifespan to about 150 years. And I said, wow, that's amazing. Have you thought about what that would mean for society? And he looked at me straight in the eye and said, no. He said, I'm, I'm way too concerned with trying to solve the problem itself to think about that. Well, I mean, if you extended the normal human lifespan to 150 years, basically every human system in place would be radically disrupted. So if uh, scientists themselves feel that they can't afford to give the attention to that kind of thing and it, it becomes a real possibility, who's going to do that sort of thinking? Well, my answer would be humanists or ideally suited to address precisely those kinds of questions. So I think that, um, that humanists can make real contributions to uh, scientific work. On the other hand, scientific work itself can make enormous contributions to the humanities because it helps humanists identify where really world-changing uh, new practices are emerging and present them with the opportunity to think about what those implications might mean for our future. So that also is uh, a really significant contribution. Now, how do you get these collaborations to happen? Well, I have a very simple and very practical suggestion. If you are a humanist and you are looking to collaborate with a scientist because of some problem or area you're interested in, go to where they hang out. Don't stay in the English building. Don't stay in the humanities center. Go down to the campus where they hang out, start attending their seminars, start up conversations, go to their offices, engage them with your questions, and see what kind of collaborations that you can work up. I, I had a brilliant, read a brilliant suggestion for interdisciplinary work, which is that institutions ask all their faculty members every five years who they want their offices to be next to. And so every faculty member would have the opportunity to get out of the English building or even to have such thing as an English building and form clusters based on their research interests. And if you hang out where the scientists are and you pay your dues by acquiring the proper vocabulary and basic knowledge and show interest by attending their seminars, my experience has been they're absolutely delighted to share their research with you, to uh, find opportunities for collaboration. And I'll just say one further thing that the reward structures in the humanities and the sciences are radically different. And humanists should appreciate the differences in these reward structures when they collaborate with scientists. As a humanist, if you write a book about non-conscious cognition, let's say, uh, you get, that goes on your vita. That's recognized as valid research in your field. 
If, however, you're a scientist and you write about uh, non-conscious cognition in novels, say, it will not be recognized as a valid, uh, valid contribution to your research. Uh, it'll be kind of passed off as uh, frivolous or uh, certainly unimportant. And so consequently, um, when you collaborate with a scientist, it's really important to recognize that um, this collaboration involves a good deal of generosity on his or her part. Nevertheless, uh, I have collaborated with numerous scientists, both in teaching and research, and I found them uh, really excited by the possibility to, for example, read science fiction and start thinking about uh, science fiction. So I co-taught a course at Duke with a, a quantum physicist on uh, science fiction, and he enjoyed it immensely, as did I. So the possibilities are there, but it behooves you as a humanist to take the initiative, go down to wherever they're hanging out, uh, and get started in conversation. And if I could just ask another practical follow-up, um, it would be um, if you could talk a little bit more about what other kinds of institutional barriers you think there are to um, in interdisciplinary research and whether you have any other strategies for facilitating that um, research in the university, um, especially for graduate students who are trying to navigate these issues um, today. And this could include thinking about advising across disciplines and thinking about other kinds of disciplinary standards and also how that might um, work for how they're presenting their work to funding bodies or job committees too. Well, uh, part of the question you asked, Kate, I didn't really address, which is uh, how do you make a presentation to different kinds of audience? And this is somewhat related to what I want to say about the institutional context. Um, in my experience, the most crucial thing that you need to know when you're making a presentation is who the audience is. And it it behooves you to get as much information about their educational level, their disciplinary orientation and so forth as you possibly can, because that will determine everything about a successful presentation. The level of um, explanation that you go into, the analogies that you use, the examples that you select, all that will be, be determined by the ways in which you envision yourself connecting with that specific audience. So if I were to give a presentation to a scientific audience, I would use very, very different approaches than if I was talking to um, English graduate students, for example. So the issue of audience is crucial and it's difficult when you have a mixed audience where you know there will be both humanists and scientists in it and uh, you just need to think really carefully about how you're going to address both of those audiences. But on the issue of institutional barriers to interdisciplinarity, there is the issue of location, which I already uh, touched on. And in addition, there's the important issue of how teaching resources are allocated. So in some institutions like Duke or at UCLA, the institutions are rich enough so that if you wanna collaborate on a course with someone, both people get credit for that course in their respective departments. But in other places, that's not possible and you have to work out different kinds of imaginative um, arrangements to make it possible to co-teach with someone across a disciplinary line. So that can be negotiated in various kinds of ways, but it is one of the institutional barriers to uh, interdisciplinary work. And in addition, it's really important, I think, for departments in the humanities to recognize and encourage interdisciplinary work and understood in the broadest sense, that is not only between people in the 17th century and in the 20th century, for example, although that can be useful too, but radically different like between quantum physics and, uh, and science fiction, for example. 
So there's a lot that can be done at the uh, departmental level. There's a lot that can be done at the institutional level. And uh, in my opinion, the rewards for interdisciplinary work are uh, justify all of the expense and the effort that it requires. Because it, um, in the real world, there are no fences called disciplinary boundaries. In the real world, all kinds of things happen that uh, the phenomenon at issue doesn't care what the boundaries are. And the pandemic is the latest, perhaps the latest, most dramatic example of that. But the world is full of complex phenomena that require multiple kinds of approaches and multiple kinds of knowledges. And that's really what gives uh, the urgency to interdisciplinary work in my, in my view. Great. Well, I'm going to follow up on the, um, you know, on your mention of the pandemic as well. I know that there's um, a lot of interest from the, from um, the organizers and students, and also talking about um, comparative media studies. But I think we'll save that for the broader Q and A. Um, but returning to the pandemic, um, you know, this is having a major effect on all graduate students um, and um, you know scholars worldwide, worldwide in the ways that they're engaging in scholarship the project of higher education and pedagogy, um, you know, with, with people all being thrown into the digital environment, taking and teaching classes on Zoom, um, having this conversation on Zoom, and also relying on digital methods for research. Um, and the pressures on graduate students who are navigating this environment are also compounded with how they're thinking about the job market and academia um, and alternative professions and all of the uncertainty that's swirling around um, there. And so one um, example that came up in this conversation was the way in which you're using technogenesis um, in your um, 2012 book, How We Think, thinking about the coevolution between technical devices and human and social and neurological adaptation. And so um, if perhaps you could think about this term in relationship to the pandemic situation, or something more broadly, um, and also whether you, you know, if there's anything that's changing in some of your conceptualizations or your sense of the future of interdisciplinary work based on some of the specific changes that are taking place under um, the pandemic conditions. Okay, well, I, I sense in your question uh, two rather different uh, topics, and one is the whole practical issue of how we as scholars and teachers and researchers and students are navigating uh, distance learning and uh, distance environments of all kinds. So I, I don't know that I have any uh, startling uh, insights to offer on that issue, except that the pandemic has really caused a lot of people, including academics, to rethink what is essential about face-to-face -face contact and what might be better handled through distance communications. So I think that is a very healthy thing. And I, I my own feeling is that when the pandemic subsides, um, there will be a lot of changes in how people go about their everyday world and their work. Uh, I expect that there will be more uh, distanced communications in offices, for example. Maybe it's not important for everyone to be there every day, eight hours and so forth. And so I think um, there's a very broad based reevaluation of what face to face communication gives that is uh, important and to be preserved and in what context and conversely what kinds of uh, advantages distance communication has and how we might best preserve those. But as to the uh, intellectual challenge that the pandemic offers uh, to the humanities, there will probably be all kinds of academic issues activated and made urgent by the pandemic that were already there in the background, but now brought out with new force. For example, economic inequalities, uh, racial equality, so on and so forth. But for me, the issue that the pandemic has really made uh, startlingly urgent is clarifying and 
reconceptualizing the relation of humans to the non-human world in general. So I had a little piece that uh, was published in the Critical Inquiry blog on our relationship to viruses. And of course, the word virus now is um, almost synonymous with pandemic, but it shouldn't be because it turns out that viruses um, function often in very productive ways for human beings, including making human reproduction itself possible. So, um, so I think it's important for us to rethink our relationship to the entire non-human world, including the microbacterial world. And a lot of humanities scholars are getting interested now in the human biome, the bacterial uh, entities that inhabit our bodies that are intrinsic to the human species, intrinsic to human life. Um, and I was talking uh, earlier with uh, Arnaud about um, what it would mean to have an ethical stance toward bacteria. Well, you know, the common thought might be in the midst of a pandemic, uh, we don't need any uh, relationship with bacteria other than to try to eradicate them. But uh, actually that's not true. Uh, it would make sense and it would actually be an important topic to talk about our relationship to bacteria in, ter in ethical terms. And I have been made uh, newly aware of that uh, when I uh, started research about uh, the importance of bacteria in gene editing and gene replacement. And it turns out that all, well, not all, but the most effective gene editing tools now rely on bacteria cognition to work. So it's a perfect example of a symbiotic relationship between conscious cognition and non-conscious cognition on the bacterial level to achieve something that neither by itself could make happen. So, uh, so gene editing in general has opened up a huge uh, uh, Pandora's box, if I can call it that, of ethical issues about human enhancement. Where do you stop with gene editing? Uh, gene editing on non-human species, which has already been extensive, including pigs and cows and mosquitoes and mice and a whole uh, plethora of different species. You know, where do we where do we stop with something like that? Is it ethical to eradicate a species entirely? For example, mosquitoes that spread malaria and so forth. What are the ethical issues here? So uh, the humanities have um, have developed methods, philosophy, conversations, theories that. Uh, can be relevant to all of these questions, and they're desperately needed in the contemporary moment. Thanks so much. I think that we're in the last minute um, of our of our conversation. Um, I can say that I've been asked recently by my four year old daughter to explain not only bacteria but what they're doing in her body, and um, I've realized exactly how much work that I need to do to even start with some of those explanations. But I'm hoping that some of that work will um, put me in a better position to um, engage with your um, with the new book that you're working on. Um, but I've really enjoyed the conversation so far and I'm looking forward to um, how we can continue it with everyone here. And so I'll hand it over to um, Claudia. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Marshall. Thank you, Professor Hales. That was really, really interesting. And there's so many things came up. I, I have like three full pages of notes uh, from that conversation of potential questions. Um, but obviously we want to open up to the audience. So just to remind everyone, you can uh, pop a question in the chat box and uh, Kristen, one of our organizers is gonna keep an eye on the chat box and intervene if she sees any questions there. Um, you can also pop up a virtual hand. I'm sure I need to change to gallery view so I can see you all. Yep, you can pop up a virtual hand and I'll call on you as well if you have a question. So um, I'm, I've got a few, but let's see if anybody else wants to jump in first. In that case, I will get the ball rolling. Um, so, so thinking back, um, 
you gave a lot of good practical advice, like solid practical advice, Professor Hales. Um, so I thank you for that. Y you mentioned though, um, when, you, when you're creating a relationship with, a, with say someone in, in a science department um, or something like that, uh, you have to pay your dues. And you talked about, you know, mastering vocabulary, sort of getting down the basics of the field in such a way that, you know, you're, you're meeting them in the middle, you're not expecting them to do all the work for you. Um, given that you have an undergraduate degree and a master's degree in chemistry, I wonder what thoughts you have on how perhaps people who don't have that background can go about gaining that expertise um, in an effective way. Because, you know, as a graduate student right now, we talk a lot already in these days that there's so much material to master just in English literature, right? Um, to sort of get to the point where we can get a PhD, we're, we're expected to sort of master so many subfields and be conversant in so many things. And then for on a personal level right now, I'm trying to master sort of not the entire field of cognitive science, but what feels like quite a big part of it, uh, which is uh, research on consciousness and research on, on social cognition and how we read other, read other, other people in social situations. And it can be quite overwhelming. So I guess I was wondering what advice you have? Do you, do you think that people should take classes in other disciplines, even as graduate students? Do you recommend, you know, students actually go and get other postgraduate degrees in other disciplines if they're really invested in doing this kind of work? Or do you think there's more, um, less drastic steps we can take to gain that expertise in such a way that we can approach people in other disciplines? Uh, well, I think either of those approaches uh, can work and can work well. The autodidactic one where you're on your own and you're trying to learn uh, some basics of another field or taking courses in that field. Um, the advantage of the autodidactic approach, of course, is that you can target your research to your specific interests where it's unlikely you're going to find that kind of targeting in a course. A course by its very nature will uh, also address a lot of issues which may seem peripheral to your interests at the time, although ultimately it all could be useful in some sense. So it kind of depends on one's individual circumstances, I think, which approach works better. But I will say about the autodidactic approach, it's important to find uh, bodies of material that you can understand and that can uh, you can address successfully. So uh, fortunately, there is a whole spectrum of level of address in scientific fields from the very beginning, very beginner level to quite advanced level. So you need to find an entry point at uh, which you can successfully understand the vocabulary, understand the methods, and then just as in a fitness gym, work up to more uh, advanced levels of knowledge. If you're taking a course, it's a great opportunity to, um, to make relationships, form relationships, form uh, collaborations and so forth. So, and also some combination of the two is perhaps inevitable. You might take a course in microbiology, for example, but then supplement that with your own reading and research along the specific uh, lines that you're interested in. The important thing is to not be discouraged by vocabulary and approaches that you are simply uh, completely ununderstandable to you. And to know that no matter where you are beginning, there is material out there that will address you in terms that you can understand. And of course, that's now more true than ever with YouTube videos and so on and so forth. So there's a wealth of information to be had. All you need are is the will and the time to do it. Now, you also mentioned that graduate students in particular are under a great deal of stress to learn to achieve true mastery in their field. But then if they're interested in interdisciplinary work to learn the, the basics of other, other fields as well. And I, I can't speak to Notre Dame because I'm not that familiar with your graduate student structure. But I know in many universities, it is possible to take a limited number of courses in other fields and have them count toward your degree work. So I think that would be an excellent opportunity where you would actually complete some of your degree requirements, but at the same time, 
be able to acquire some basics in an interdisciplinary field that you know you want to work in. So I, I would recommend that to graduate students as well. And it is always the case uh, when you're trying to work in a field of which you're not a true master, there is a certain level of anxiety that you're going to get things wrong, that, um, that you're not understanding correctly, and so on and so forth. And uh, I would simply say it's really important not to let that anxiety prevent you from going forward. There's also anxiety in becoming a master of your own field where uh, you're constantly faced with the problem that you may not be adequate to the, the challenges that are being put before you. But my own feeling is you can meet every challenge if it is scaled appropriately. That is, you, you don't expect to meet every challenge successfully at an advanced level, but uh, if you're willing to start at the level at which you can participate and work up, every challenge can be met. So it's only a question of finding the right level for you and the passion uh, which will lead to a real thrill of discovery. And that's what, that's what helps to compensate for the anxiety the thrill that you are really on to important new ideas and that these are your ideas and that you can have something important to say in the ongoing conversations about them. Thank you uh, very much. We've actually got a few hands up here. So um, Professor Walls, I think you were the first hand up. Okay, great, thank you. Um... Hi, Kate. It's good to see you again. Uh, yeah, good to see you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is one of the great advantages of, of COVID, I have to say, that um, we can do these meetings virtually, which suddenly opens up such wonderful um, connections. I've been, um, I was fascinated by your description of problem thinking versus problematic thinking. Um, I, I identified immediately with it, and yet I, in, in another sense, I, I left, you know, I was thinking, well, how would I put that in my own work? And I realized um, it's the role of history in that, and I'm wondering, um, I guess I'll say quickly that, you know, I imagine myself trying to solve a problem of, uh, in, uh, that is a historical problem. At this point, I'm thinking about um, the origins of the concept of Gaia in the 19th century. So there's a very historical question about the scientists who were working you know, 200 years ago and how they came to the con uh, uh, concepts they did. And then you know, a historical question about why they were silenced. And so that's one kind of problem solution. I, in doing that work and reading, let's say Charles Darwin, um, when I meet scientists today who, let's say, evolutionary scientists, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to raise quest historical questions, let's say, about what Darwin actually said, you know, for instance, his theories of aesthetics um, in sexual selection, and discover that they're really not, that's not really relevant to what they're doing. And so it's harder to create a connection. Um, you know, even saying something like, gee, did you know that somebody had similar ideas 200 years ago and this is how they played out? And they're like, I didn't know and I'm really not sure that matters to me. Uh, which opens a sort of third dimension, which is historical work and historical research where the scientists I work with are uh, just the long, long since in the grave. Um, but it seems that their work has relevance in ways that um, um, I wonder if, if that's sort of the third dimension to your thinking or where would you put historical research in the kind of sketch that you're uh, doing? Because I know you've researched, for instance, uh, the history of quantum physics. So I know you're familiar with, with the problem. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking here of a remark I heard Gerald Edelman make uh, about his own research in, um, in neurobiology. Uh, where he's, and of course he won the Nobel Prize for, for his work. Um, he spent part of his time reading historical documents related to his field. And the reason he was willing to spend time like that is uh, 
that it was his opinion there were many promising approaches mm -hmm. which never reached fruition. And that mm -hmm. uh, when he felt he was at a dead end in some aspect of his research, his technique was to go back into the history of the field and look for those uh, avenues that were cut off prematurely, mm -hmm. if you will, um, that could be reactivated in another context and made much more productive. Um, now, I, I mentioned, you know, it's good to be sensitive to the kind of constraints that scientists are, are working under. So I, mm -hmm. I do understand why some of your scientific colleagues might <laughs> feel impatient and say, well, that's not immediately relevant. Um, but the ones that are a little um, wiser than that might realize that uh, actually there are advantages to remaining open to historical knowledges that did not prevail, but nevertheless might have something important to contribute to the present situation. And, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to persuade someone of that if they're not already uh, of that mind. But to me, I think that's the, that's the real advantage of historical knowledge from a scientific perspective, to mm -hmm. be able to better understand why we are where we are and what, uh, mm -hmm. what doors were closed to lead to this path and whether those doors might want to be opened again. Really helpful. I think the question of the Anthropocene has really raised this because, of course, the geologists have one set of concerns, which is identifying what it is and where the golden spike should be driven so that it establishes that as a geological epoch in their terms. Then we come in and we have lots of other questions that, uh, you know, if it started in 1950 or, for instance, that's not the question we want to ask. And so I think that the general discussion about Anthropocene studies is opening up the historical ground in, in some interesting ways between scientists and historians and humanists, because they'll acknowledge, yes, it matters to how we got here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we can create really, really productive conversations um, around this kind of questions of trajectories yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and recovering yeah. historical past that, as you say, were lost. Thank you so much. I'll defer to others now. Um, thank you. Great. Uh, Professor Tomasula. Hey, thanks. That, that was great, Kate. As you know, as usual, this new work is just so like prescient <laughs> and uh, uh, necessary in our moment. And you know, I think I'm asking. Uh, a similar question that um, Laura just did only maybe from a little different perspective. And that, that's, uh, you know, your attention to language and all of this, um, um, you know, kind of finding a common language to cross between the humanities and the science, or, or I guess it's not even like common language. It's, you know, I, maybe a little bit way, better way to describe it would be more like, it seems like a Venn diagram to me, you know, on when you read the sciences, I'm often struck by how literal minded they are. Where, as you say, in the humanities, we have a much more kind of flexible notion of, of uh, vocabulary and things like that. And, and, it, it, and it seems like what you're actually doing more is not so much finding a common language, but finding the point where the, the Venn diagrams can intersect. Uh, and maybe just as an example, I'm thinking of, a, um, you know, like OO ontology or new materialism and talk, you know, where we'll discuss things in the terms of like the agency of a clay tablet, for example, where you could just hear the reaction from the sciences and start talking with that kind of language. But, you know, you're, uh, you know, if I could use your example of when you're talking about um, CRISPR and how, um, it sort of depends on your your conception of uh, non-human cognition, and so it it as you were describing earlier, it just seems to blend that kind of rigor that we associate with the sciences with this uh, more open-ended way of thinking about uh, things like cognition or just even communication. 
So I guess I'm just curious if you would like to talk about that um, middle zone in, in language between uh, these two different areas, two different fields. Yeah. Um, well, thanks. Thanks, Stephen. It's great to see you. I'm, I'm so pleased that you were willing to spend time to tap into this conversation. That's great. Uh, so oh. about, the, about the middle zone, if you will, uh, one, I think the other one, way around, believe me. <laughs> one, one truism for scientists is that they're still very much um, adherence to the crystal globe idea of rhetoric, that the purpose of, uh, purpose of language and the purpose of writing is to create a transparent medium that will directly convey concepts from your mind to my mind or vice versa. Um, and of course, as humanists, we know there's a huge body of research on precisely the way in which uh, the globe is never transparent, the glass is never transparent, that it always has implications for what is said and, and how uh, ideas are conceptualized and so forth. So uh, scientists are often sort of surprised by this because it's one of their base assumptions of carrying on scientific discourse. Uh, but the ones that are really thoughtful do understand that scientific discourse is full of metaphors and that those metaphors have a, a very direct and large force on the way that they direct thought along some channels and cut off thought in other channels. So, um, as you know, as literary critics and as writers and scholars, we um, we spend a great deal of time thinking about how metaphors uh, affect the way that ideas are conceptualized, what ideas are conceptualized, and so forth. So we have a, a large and um, historical traditional body of information about that, and also a huge variety of methods to approach precisely this question. And I think that uh, we can share some of that ideas with scientists when it's relevant. And of course, a lot of work in uh, STS has already done that, but I think it's a continuing joint venture between the sciences and the humanities to clarify the way in which media are um, in which media always have an influence on what is said within that medium. And to just expand on that a little bit, uh, in this recent work, I'm also trying to develop the idea that to, once I thought of it, it was you know, immediately self-evident to me that media are species specific and that each species has media uh, that it, regularly employs that are distinct to its species capabilities, sensoria, uh, and so forth. And think what it would do to media studies if we took this seriously, mm -hmm. that media studies ought to be about much more than uh, media directed to humans. It should be a study of media in general including all the ways in which non-human species use media and the intersections between various kinds of media spheres between uh, different kinds of species. That's a whole area of media studies, which from a humanities point of view uh, has been vastly underdeveloped, although again, biosemioticians have been talking about this. But uh, it just all hinges for me on, on what I take to be one simple realization. And that is the importance of signs and symbols in cognitive activities and how important it is when, uh, when an organism, a life form, begins to be able to use implicit or explicit signs. And of course, Terence Deacon wrote this book, The Symbolic Species, about how humans are the only species able to symbolize in abstract forms. But that should not prevent us from realizing 
that signs are pervasive throughout uh, the biological kingdom and that the creation and the use, the transmission and the interpretation of signs is what clearly distinguishes biological activity from what I call material processes. Because once you have interpretation of signs, essentially you have cognition. And um, that's something that chemical processes in themselves and by themselves cannot do, physiochemical processes that is. So I, I just think, you know, this realization of how pervasive sign activity is and right along with that goes the realization of how pervasive meaning making activities are, mm -hmm. uh, has a tremendous revolutionary force for how the humanities conceptualize what it is they do and how they go about doing it. Cool. Yeah, may maybe if I could just, uh, you know, just off the <laughs> top of my head, I'm just, Curious how how you would think of um, extending that into narrative then? Yeah, well, um, this is such a complex topic. That it's yeah, hard to that's right. It, I realize that. Uh, but let's just say that we're focusing only on written narratives. And let's just say, because I know you're a novelist and a short story writer, that we're only focusing on, um, on linguistic narratives in story form. Uh, okay, so linguistic narratives in story form involve complex levels of coding and decoding by human readers that uh, are activated on levels way below consciousness. So non-conscious recognition of patterns, the link between what one reads and the embodied responses that one has to what one has read go way beyond consciousness. Um, and I, I could even argue that consciousness has the smallest part of comprehending a written narrative, although of course it's essential to comprehending a written narrative. But all those levels of somatic uh, reaction to the narrative that one is reading or writing, uh, all the ways in which emotions are mobilized and become part of the cognitive structure of uh, reception, all of those are issues that uh, in my mind have not been adequately explored in critical or literary theory to this point, although obviously there's some work on that. But I think the non-conscious dimensions of writing and reading uh, are a vast unexplored territory that uh, deserve to be explored much more fully than they have been at present. Yeah, thank you so much. Does anybody else uh, have a question they want to jump in? I'll remind you that you can pop them in the chat if you'd rather not um, sort of speak up on video and one of our moderators can throw it out. Um, but you can also stick up a virtual hand if you have a question. Yeah, and, um, Claudia, I'll jump in here with my own question. Um, and it's about media, but a more, <laughs> much more practical <laughs> Um, approach to um, to media and thinking about comparative media um, and how as graduate students um, we're thinking about publication um, that's maybe a away from the traditional humanities print media and more into a, a digital humanities um, and comparative media. Uh, so I wondered if you could, first of all, um, maybe explain what you mean by a comparative um, media studies, um, how that might be different than um, just a media studies, I guess, in, a, in terms of how a graduate student might be trying to navigate uh, media studies. Uh, and I know we have a few people here who are in the art department or in film departments. Um, so navigating um, media in terms of 
of those fields as well. Um, and then if you see kind of this turn to digital humanities and comparative media studies as essential to interdisciplinarity or um, as collaborating in an interdisciplinary um, fashion. Well, uh, thanks for that question. And um, when I first began thinking about comparative media studies, I was really thinking about uh, the fact that um, print is so often opposed to digital media and that um, people in English departments tend to line up on one side or the other side uh, of that uh, dichotomy. And to me, that's a, a very unproductive and uh, unhelpful kind of binary. And I was looking for ways to argue that uh, scholars interested in the history of the book, history of print and so forth, have uh, every reason to make common cause with scholars interested in digital methods and that thinking of them both as comparative media studies was a way to create a framework that would help to dissolve that binary and create new centers of interest where scholars of print could, um, could see scholars interested in digital media as their collaborators and not as their enemies. So, um, Recently, you know, I've been interested in expanding the whole concept of comparative media studies to other species as well. But uh, just confining our present discussion to comparative textual media, uh, which would leave out films as well as, you know, animal cries and a lot of other stuff. But just if you're talking about comparative textual media, um, it's almost impossible now to talk about print without simultaneously talking about uh, digital technologies because there is no print in the sense of being produced by um, movable type any longer. No, it's, it's all done through computers. And eventually you get the rotary presses and web presses and so forth impressing in mar ink marks on paper. But uh, the whole issue of computational media has completely interpenetrated those processes. You're seeing only the end product uh, in, and to isolate the end product from everything that produced it is an entirely artificial division. So in my most recent book called Postprint, Books and Becoming Computational, I try to address this issue specifically, and I try to address it not only through interviews, through archival research uh, into printing technologies and so forth, but also I was interested in addressing it in, in the materiality of the book. So I worked with a designer at uh, Columbia University Press to create a, a form that would insist materially on this interpenetration as well as uh, in the argument of the book. So we created some pages that we called x-ray pages where they're print pages in a book, but their purpose is to display the underlying code that is producing some of those pages in the book. And so it's as though uh, the page surface has uh, become uh, amenable to an X-ray penetration looking down to the code beneath that helped to generate uh, that page. So you literally can't read the book without encountering some of the coding sequences that produce the book. And it, uh, this was an attempt to try to create a materiality of the book that would be adequate to the ideas expressed in the book. As to whether comparative media studies are essential to interdisciplinaria, interdisciplinarity, um, I'm not so sure about that. I think they can be one way to do interdisciplinary research. Um, but I, I feel less 
convinced that they're essential to interdisciplinary research. I think there are other ways to do interdisciplinary research that wouldn't necessarily engage these kinds of questions. But what I do insist upon is that they are essential to literary research. I think for literary purposes, you really cannot do research in the contemporary period without uh, engaging some version of comparative media studies because, uh, because of, of exactly what I said, that computational media have completely interpenetrated everything about literary studies from the production of books itself to how we do research, to how we present our research and so forth. Thanks, Christian and Professor Hales. Um, Arno, you've got a hand up. Yeah, although I, I knew as part of as the three organizers, I know I want to definitely make sure we have others speak up first. So if anybody wants to go ahead of me, doesn't okay. I'll I'll jump in then. Um, Professor Hales, I'm going back to that professor you spoke to uh, a long time ago, who who you know was saying that you solve problems and that uh, and that he addresses problematics. Uh, and that confrontation you talked about, A, it was hilarious, and B, it was so revelatory, right, of, of, about a kind of fundamental distinction. And I think what you, you helped me understand when you, when you noted that anecdote was that um, there is an appeal and there's an attractiveness to the urgency of real world problems and that humanities should perhaps have a bit more of a standard bearing, a kind of flag bearing role in addressing uh, those questions. But my sense is, and I, and I don't work particularly in more activist disciplines, but it strikes me that African American studies, critical race studies are doing that work, and yet don't necessarily get the um, aura of interdisciplinarity. They don't get that halo, they don't get that glow uh, in the same way that, say, digital humanities gets it or um, uh, advancing kind of pioneering work on responsible innovation that brings you know, philosophical ethics and law and uh, engineering together might. Um, so could you speak a little bit more in, in the spirit of perhaps that professor who, um, you know, defended the cause of, of addressing problematics, things that are, that are deeper tissue, that are structural, that are long-term problems that, that, you know, begin before Othello and continue past Trayvon Martin, um, that, that really require that kind of longitudinal approach, that kind of historical approach that Dr. Walls was talking about, how do you most charitably recover those and say, we still need to address problematics. We can't, we can't um, tether the humanities to the urgency of real world problems if we think of real world problems as these kind of um, immediately on the horizon or kind of the horizon plus or minus epsilon, right? A little bit before, a little bit after. <laughs> Um, kind of time range. We, if we have problems that really begin, uh, you know, from Adam and Eve onwards, if you if you buy that story, then how how do you how do you get rid of the humanities, or how do you how can you dismiss the humanities and say that they don't have a role in addressing world world problems? It seems like they do intrinsically, but we don't have a good way to talk about it. Do you have any insights, or can you channel that professor uh, who defended you know the defense of problematics and, and give him his best? or her best, you know, defense, uh, the most charitable take on that and help us maybe articulate our own ways of defending a humanities that doesn't necessarily look interdisciplinary, but is clearly addressing real world, real world yeah. realities. Uh, well, I have some thoughts on that, but first I want to note uh, your assumption that interdisciplinary does have a halo. <laughs> I, I'm very pleased to hear it, although I'm not sure everyone agree would agree that it has a halo at all. But on to the on I've to been the I've been hanging out with administrators for too long, perhaps. Okay. On to the real substance of your question. I think that the kind of the way to think about this conundrum is precisely the one that you were hinting at, which is that there are many, many problems that uh, cannot be solved without looking into the history and long traditions that they embody. And nowhere do we see this more clearly than in the problem of race in this, in this country, for example. You can't even begin to think about uh, solving the present 
uh, critical issues of racial tension, racial oppression, racial injustices, and so forth, without going to the, into the history of what race means in the context of this entire um, republic. So I think that certain problems are so deep-seated and so complex and so bound up with historical trajectories that they can't successfully be addressed as problems without simultaneously seeing them as problematics. So um, yeah, the big issues are all like that. Uh, economic inequalities, the same kind of thing. You know, how did we get into a capitalist regime in the first place? Uh, what are the assumptions that are baked in at the beginning into that? And how do we begin to at least recognize or perhaps even challenge or question so that some of those assumptions uh, also? It's, it's got to be done simultaneously along both axes, the diachronic and the synchronic, to be successful, I think. The really big issues are all like that. They all have complex histories that um, have to be addressed, understood, unraveled, just, uh, talked about in order to even begin to approach the uh, present moment. You know, how do you understand Black Lives Matter without understanding slavery and before slavery, uh, all of the assumptions about white entitlement and so forth. So. Yeah, I think that's a, a really um, a really important issue, and it's really important for humanists to be able to make that case coherently and clearly. I suppose a follow up, Professor Yells, if I may, is that um, and and I don't have a good pulse on where the academy is at this point. I don't know that anybody really has, but there's a sense sometimes in engineering disciplines or science disciplines, um, it's not positivism, but it is it is a kind of firm belief in progress and the ability to actually finally identify and well-define a problem and then actually address it with, with concrete solutions. Sometimes in the course of our, of our long trajectory kind of responses in the humanities, um, you can accrue such a sense that there's not going to be progress, right? That, that the problems remain intractable and that they, they persist with us under new guises that a kind of humanistic pessimism uh, sets in. And I've been wondering if you have any thoughts on that as a perhaps disciplinary distinction that, that the sciences do seem to really believe in their own ability to make progress as it were for the human condition, um, sometimes also for the non-human condition. But in the humanities, we sometimes struggle to believe in that, in that kind of progress attitude or we develop different forms of cynicism, um, perhaps just born out of methodology. I was wondering if you've noticed that or if that's if you would say, no, on the contrary, it sounds like we're still having productive criticism and actually being constructive. Yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely agree with your assessment that if there is a feeling that progress is possible in the sciences. And I think many people in the humanities, especially in our field of literary studies, are deeply cynical about the idea that progress is even possible. And it, it very much depends, I think, on your frame of reference and also ultimately on what your values are. So um, the one thing we can say definitively in the humanities is that there is such a thing as change and that change can be radical. And uh, we in the 20th century and the 21st century have seen so much evidence of that, I think it's basically irrefutable. And those changes are complex. I mean, let's just take, for example, uh, compare any village in Europe in 1000 AD to any country in Europe now in 2021, and the changes are enormous. You know, they're uh, antibiotics, for example, there's the internet, there's rapid transportation, there's this, there's that, and you know, you have enormous, enormous changes going on. It would be difficult to say unequivocally that any one of those changes is an un 
uh, unequivocal good. Uh, I mean, take something that's as seemingly uncontroversial as antibiotics. Well, of course, yes, you want to have antibiotics, but on the other hand, you're also encouraging with every use of antibiotics, bacterial increased resistance. So now we get um, resist, bacteria resistant tuberculosis and all of the other things. So every single one of those changes is complex. It uh, has probably has aspects that everyone could agree were benign and it probably has aspects that everyone could agree are uh, deleterious. So uh, it's difficult to know how you would assess this overall. And it may simply come down to saying, uh, what do you value most? So uh, the answer may be different for different people. I mean, there may, I don't put it out of question that there may be people who would prefer to live in a medieval village in the year 1000 than to live in uh, Notre Dame in 2021. You know, it's, it's not beyond reason that some people would make that choice. Um, so, I, so I guess I'm giving a kind of hedged answer. Some change may be progress, some change may not be progress, but what we can say unequivocally is there is change. And there are some who come to there are some who come to Notre Dame hoping it will be a medieval village. Uh, so, <laughs> well, indeed, and they're probably very disappointed. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Hales. Thanks, Erno. We've got time for one more question. Is someone who'd like to jump in? Okay, in that case. Um, I'll go ahead and ask a pretty broad sort of wrap up question, which is in our reading group um, last week, uh, uh, myself and a, a few other graduate students um, were talking about um, the necessity of interdisciplinary work going, going both ways. So, you know, if you're, in, if you're intervening in the sciences in some way, um, there, there seemed to be a sort of uh, sense that there was a need for the humanities counterpart to be contributing just as much as the science counterpart, and also an anxiety around the fact that that was not recognized as valuable or necessary in the same way. You know, they, there might be an idea around interdisciplinary work that that involves taking stuff from the STEM fields and applying it to the humanities to make the humanities better in some way, and you know. The, the only word I can think of is anxiety around that sort of hierarchy of value in the disciplines and are we perpetuating that and how can we avoid perpetuating that if we're engaging in interdisciplinary work ourselves like what responsibilities do we have to sort of push the humanities outwards in the same way that we're taking in from other disciplines um, do we even have that responsibility um, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on that you also mentioned um, you know when you were writing when you're speaking with Professor Marshall you, you spoke a bit about on thought that book on cognition and you talked a little bit about um, how when you're when you're engaging with scientists you, you have a you have an awareness that you know if you write a book on cognition it counts for your professional development but if they write a book on literature it's not going to count for them um, so I guess I was wondering you know how you see that sort of it, how much you think it's an absolute necessity and what and in what way for that to be a two-way street or do you see it are you less anxious about that um, than perhaps some of us are Uh, well, I'm not, I don't think I'm fully grasping the source of the anxiety you're speaking about. Uh, maybe it's because I don't primarily think about interdisciplinary work as making the humanities better. Uh, there is some aspect of interdisciplinary work that can make the humanities better. But what I really think about it is that interdisciplinary work, interdisciplinary work allows one to address questions that cannot be satisfactorily addressed from either one discipline or the other. That it, um, it allows the possibility for new kinds of questions and new kinds of answers to emerge. So the question of um, 
is there an equality between what the humanists take from the scientists and what the scientists take from the humanists? That might be one way to uh, phrase the anxiety you're talking about. And my answer to that is from the scientist's point of view, that is not an equal exchange. That uh, the humanist is apt to get much more out of that relationship than the scientist is. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's true. Um, it is for sure, well, one of my colleagues satirized this problem by saying that what humanists are basically saying to scientists is this, you give me your best ideas and then I'll tell you what's wrong with them. So, uh, so that's, that's one way to think about it. Uh, but there is this inherent inequality because, as I mentioned, the way the two reward structures in the fields are, are structured. Um, so typically when a scientist turns to broader questions that involve humanistic concerns, from the point of view of his scientific colleagues, he's become an old duffer who can't do the real research anymore. And so he's migrated into these interdisciplinary fields. And I think that perception is very widely uh, shared among scientists, that if you're talking about interdisciplinary issues, you've ceased to be a real scientist and you become one of those old guys who spends his time uh, messing around with the humanists. Um, but I, I don't think you can really talk about uh, the benefits to the sciences and the humanities as individual disciplines and do justice to the potential of interdisciplinary work. I think interdisciplinary work is crucially important because it opens up issues and questions that cannot be successfully addressed within the confines of either of those fields by itself. And that's the, that's the real payoff, so to speak. It's kind of a collateral benefit if it improves the humanities. It's kind of a collateral benefit if it improves the sciences. But the real uh, meat of the issue is what it allows you to do that you cannot do from either of those two fields by itself. And that's where it seems to me the contribution is central and really urgent. So that's... Uh, that's the way I would look at it. And is there anxiety uh, associated with that? Yeah, of course there is. There's the anxiety of fearing that you won't be adequate to the challenge and this challenge is huge. There's the anxiety of fearing that by leaving your, inter your disciplinary silo, uh, your work might fall into some kind of interstellar space that uh, where it isn't recognized by anyone, it isn't recognized by the sciences, it isn't recognized by the humanities. Um, and I would say, yeah, those are, those are recognizable anxieties to me, and I certainly have felt them and do feel them. But, um, but what drives you on is the idea that you can actually make a contribution that uh, simply could not be even envisioned from a disciplinary silo in itself. And that's, uh, that's the lure, that's the attraction, that's the challenge, and that's also the anxiety. And all of those are wrapped up together. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that's a good place to stop. We're a couple of minutes over time anyway. So I'd just like to thank, um, first of all, Professor Hales for agreeing to participate. Um, it was excellent. I really enjoyed the conversation and the Q&A. We got some really good ideas and uh, thoughts out. Um, so thank you very, very much for agreeing to participate. Um, I really enjoyed it. And I think, I think many of us really enjoyed it as well. Thank you as well to all of our guests for coming and asking such great questions. Um, I just want to remind everyone that in a month from now, we are going to have um, Kirsten Oster uh, visiting us from Rice. Um, and she does work in the medical humanities and digital humanities, working on big data and issues of uh, presentation of big data and how that, uh, how that is implicated in social issues and so on and so forth. Um, so watch out for an email on that. We're also continuing our reading group. Um, so if anybody wants to join in on the reading group, we usually have our reading group the week before our guest session. So we'll also be sending out an email on that. Everyone is very welcome. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you again to Professor Hales. And of course, thank you to Professor Marshall too um, for helping out with this uh, visit.
And thank you, Claudia, and thank uh, Kate and all of the contributors here. I really enjoyed our conversation and it was a privilege to have this conversation with you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.